say good morning to each and every one of you. I want to welcome you to the service this morning. Um, I know it was a late night last night for, probably for many of you and maybe you're a little bit tired this morning. So I'm going to ask you all to stand, turn to your neighbor, wish them a, a happy new year, um, greet them, whatever you need to do. Now take your hymn to the church and turn to song number 213. <clears throat> Angels from the realms of glory. Song number 213. We just came through um, the, we call the holiday season, obviously Christmas and stuff, and th that is past, but some of these songs um, that I selected here is more of a remembrance of that. Let's not forget... Um, as we go into the new year, what we just celebrated and the significance of it. Let's omit verse 3. So 1, 2, 4, and 5. <clears throat> Boy, I just not forget to figure out what the pitch is here. <clears throat> what is it with nothing? <laughs> Angels from the realms of glory I want to draw your attention to verse 5 there. It stuck out to me this morning as I was reading through this. Sinners wrung with true repentance, doomed for guilt to endless pains. Justice now revokes the sentence. Mercy calls you, break your chains. <clears throat> now turn to song number 202. <clears throat> number 202. Let all mortal flesh keep silence. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
is Song number 227. <clears throat> what child is this? Song number 227.
Song number 222. Lo, how a rose are blooming. Song number 222. For our final song, turn to song number 116. The Lord is in his holy temple. I'd like to sing this as a prayer. And the amen at the end.
Good morning, and a Happy New Year to each one of you. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you. Lord, thank you for another new day. Lord, thank you for your son. And as we came through a time of, of um, commemorating and just um, celebrating Christ's birth, we're just grateful for salvation. And Lord, we're grateful for your mercies and that they are new every morning. And even this morning, as we look at another year, Lord, we are uh, just grateful for your mercies for this coming year and for this past year. And I pray that as we come together and worship, that you would uh, be honored and glorified through our time here. I pray for Vanson as he preaches up in Elkhart. Bless the service there and be with them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Vanson is preaching up in Elkhart, so that's where they're at, and it looks like we still have a lot of people um, traveling and visiting other places. Welcome our visitors. It's good to have some Kansas folks here this morning, so welcome Steve and your family. Somehow a minister slipped in and I didn't catch it, so I was out at their church this summer, and, um, and I was able to sit and listen, and so... Um, I guess I'll return the favor. So blessings to you. Thank you for, for worshiping here this morning. Arthur Stace of Sydney, Australia, was an illiterate alcoholic. And in the 1940s, Arthur heard a message that was life-changing. He was powerfully saved through that message, and as he grew in his relationship with Christ, he was cured of his alcoholism, and he had a change of heart, not only a change of heart, but he was a changed man. One day he heard a powerful sermon where the preacher preached and repeatedly shouted the word eternity, and it made an impact on Arthur. The preacher stated that he wished all of Sydney would hear the word and contemplate where they would spend eternity. The preacher described his message as a one-word sermon, eternity. And at that moment, something struck Arthur, and he made a resolution. Arthur walked out of that sermon and he, in flowing script, wrote the word eternity on the sidewalk with a piece of chalk. Arthur was illiterate. Arthur doesn't know how he knew how to write that word, and he couldn't explain it. But for 35 years, Arthur went throughout the city of Sydney, Australia, writing this word at night. And he would write it on subway walls eternity. He would write it on the street and on the sidewalk, eternity. And he would write it wherever he could or wherever he thought it appropriate, all under cover of darkness where people wouldn't see him. For 35 years he did this. One newspaper estimated that he would write this word some 500,000 times. In fact, the Sydney of the city of Sydney, they took notice and they began to look for the eternity man, Mr. Eternity, trying to figure out who was writing this. And for years, nobody discovered his identity. In 1956, a reverend caught him writing this word and inquired who he was. And that's when he um, disclosed that it, who his name, who he really was, Arthur Stace. Only four photographs were ever taken of him in those 35 years. For Arthur, it was a way to get people to realize and to think about their future and eternity and where they would spend it. In fact, Arthur writing this word was such a part of Sydney's lore that in 1999, and many of you will remember, um, the millennial celebration of 1999. 
Some of you are too young to remember that, but many of us remember the Y2K and the the uh, fright that was uh, painted with that whole thing. In 1999, the celebration, New Year's Eve 1999, was a big thing. I was working on a construction crew, and we had a project on a customer's house, and it needed to be done by the 31st. It needed to be done for their, 19, for their New Year's celebration. And so 1999 was a, it wasn't just a normal New Year's Eve celebration like we had last night, but it was a big deal. And the, Sydney, uh, the city of Sydney, uh, in, their, in their celebrations that, that New Year's Eve, they replicated Arthur's handwriting, the way he would write this word, eternity, and they put it on a very famous bridge, the Sydney Harbor Bridge, for all to see. Eternity. And in the middle of the world's millennial celebrations, this was painted across the city bridge for all to see. Viewers from around the world saw the simple gospel message of a reformed, illiterate, once alcoholic man who had been changed by the Lord. Only one piece of chalk in one word, eternity. You know, Arthur made a commitment, or maybe, maybe you could say a resolution, when Christ came into his life. He made a resolution to do something that would affect the people around him. He made a, made a resolution to be a witness to people around him. And he affected thousands, possibly even millions, for those 35 years that he wrote that word, eternity. Resolutions. I don't know how many of you make New Year's resolutions. I've never been a big one to specifically make New Year's resolutions. And I think one of the reasons I don't is because I hear how unsuccessful they are. And so I always think, well, uh, if I'm going to make a resolution, it's going to be outside of New Year's. And I don't know if that's a good excuse or not. But resolutions are interesting, and, and many people make resolutions. And so let's look at what happens. Two of the most popular American resolutions are health or specifically uh, diet, changing either going on a diet or eating healthy or exercise. So those are three things you could list under health. Often people make resolutions geared towards health or towards saving money. And that's probably, if a lot of us make resolutions, often those resolutions are kind of geared around something like that. The interesting thing is that 10% of people actually keep their New Year's resolutions for an extended period of time. 25% fail after one week. 35% fail after one month. 55% fail after six months. But 52% of the people who made commitments were confident that they would keep it. And I think it's interesting that 52% were confident they could keep it, and 55% at six months had already failed. We had this discussion last night as we were, some of us from church were together for New Year's Eve, and somebody was asking when a good time would be to purchase a used piece of exercise equipment. <laughs> and I said, probably February, according to this, because by then people are starting to get burned out and they're going to give up. So maybe we say, well, there's, there's no use in making a resolution. If these are the results, there's no use in making a New Year's resolution. The interesting thing is that the people who have the same goals of the people who make the resolutions only 4% of them are successful when they don't make a resolution. So you may have the same goal. This person makes a resolution to do it. He's 10% of those people are successful. Or you have the same goal and this person decides not to make a resolution. 4% are successful. So you could say there is a 6% advantage to making a resolution. Resolutions, do you make them? Are you successful in keeping them in your life? 
I have to wonder if we do this poor in keeping life resolutions, how do we do with Christian res resolutions or commitments when we make a commitment to follow Christ? How well do we do in, in um, committing to our devotions this next year? Or how well do we do in, in committing to praying for my brother or, or serving those in the church? Do we have the same follow-through? As we make those commitments, do 10% of us maintain that commitment? Or do 25% of us fail after one week? Or do 35% of us fail after one month? Or do 55% of us fail after six months? How well do we do at keeping resolutions that we make as Christians? Today is New Year's Day, and I don't know how many of you made a resolution last night. As we stayed up last night, I warned the people that were in our group, I said, if I catch two of your eyes closed at the same time this morning during church, I may have you give a testimony, so you've been fairly warned. Eternity. How are you doing with your spiritual resolutions? How are you doing with your spiritual commitments? We have scripture telling us that there are a lot of people that are going to make commitments and are going to have goals and they're going to fall short of it. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 says, and 14 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Gives a picture that there are a lot of people on a path, but there are few people who are actually going to get where they're hoping to go. Another scripture, and I shared this the last time that I preached, uh, when I spoke about wealth and our affluence and how it affects us, is Mark 10.25, and it says, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And so there are things around us that affect us and our goals. And one of those is wealth. And we are all wealthy people. We're all wealthy people according to, compared to world standards. And that affects us. It affects our goal. It affects resolutions that we have made. It affects where we want to go. Another verse in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So there's going to be a lot of people who say, Lord, I want to follow you. I make a commitment. I make a resolution to follow you. But they fall short. They get distracted. They're maybe part of the 45%, the 55% that after six months they get tired. Where are you at in that? Where are you at in your resolution of following Christ? Are you still faithful? I want to look this morning at keeping resolutions. And I have several, several points here that hopefully, I think, can help us keep resolutions that we may make just for general life, but are also very effective when applied to spiritual resolutions. And that's what I want to focus on. Turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter, th chapter 3. The text is taken out of Colossians. The title of the message is Eternal Resolutions. But I specifically want to look at how to make a resolution and how to follow through with it. Not as much in what for resolution you make, although I want to challenge you to make eternal resolutions. But I want to focus more on how to follow through. And like I said, I think if you write down these 
these points. They will help you if you made a resolution last night or this morning for this coming year. They will help you with your spiritual resolution, but also in living out a resolution that you made for this coming year outside of, of um, a spiritual resolution. Colossians chapter 3 calls us to change. And one of the motivating things that you need for change is you need reason. There needs to be a reason to change. And so if I don't realize that there's a reason, if, if I'm not aware of the why, there's, there's no purpose in making a resolution. So the first thing in following through with resolution is to have reason. Beginning to read in verse 1 of chapter 3, it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And I'm going to stop there. The first thing is that we need to have reason. And that reason in this passage is, if ye then be risen with Christ. There is a change that has happened when we make a resolution to follow Christ. When we, when we rise up and we commit to following Him, there is a reason that there should be change because we're following Christ. We have committed to follow Him. It's our, our resolution. It's, it's what we've, we've said we're going to do. It's, it's a goal that we've made is to follow Him. And so that's our reason. If you then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. This reason is, it should, it's, it's our desire, it's our identity, it's the focus that we have, it's the commitment that we've made, it's the, the passion that we feel, is to be risen with Christ, to follow him. It's a choice that we've made in our life. To change and to follow. It's a resolution that I believe most of us have made. The next part of the verse, it tells us how to follow through that res resolution. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on, sitteth on the right hand of God. We're supposed to seek those things. And that brings us to... Our second point, set a long-term goal. You know, if, we don't, if we're not shooting for something, if we don't have something in mind for the end of a resolution, we don't know where we're going. And so it's important that we set, set a, a clear goal of, of where I want to be. What have you committed to in your Christian life? Where are you hoping to be? What is your end goal? What does eternity look like for you? And is it clear? Is it clear in your mind where you're going? Sometimes as we set that goal, it's important to look back and realize where I was at before I set that goal. So leading up to New Year's Eve when I made a resolution, where was I at? And what was happening before I made that resolution? What brought me to the point that I made a commitment saying, I'm going to do this? In the same way in our, in our Christian life, where were we at before we made a commitment to Christ? What was it that brought us to that point where we said, I need to make a change. I'm going to follow Christ. It's important that we look at where I, what I used to do and where I used to be, and then also set a clear goal of this is what I'm going to do and this is where I'm going. And clearly realizing what success is for me in this resolution. Having a clear end goal. Verse 2 talks about a clear goal. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. Set your affection on things above is a clear goal for us. Affections 
are not just actions. Affections are our desires. Affections are what I focus on. Affections are what drives me. Affections are what, when I get up in the morning, it's, it's what, what first comes to mind. It's what I live out of. It says we're supposed to set our affections on things above. It's my interests, my passions. It's what I think about. It's the thoughts that go through my mind. And as a Christian, those passions, those interests, those goals should be eternal. They should be eternal. Everything I do should be done through that lens of eternity. That commitment should affect how I live day-to-day life. Verse 3 says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. It refers back to our reason. That we're risen with Christ. We're dead to self. We're risen to Christ. We're alive in Christ, but dead to self. So it's referring back to that reason. Then verse 4 says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. You know, this is a result of that long-term commitment, is to be with Christ, to be with him in glory. It's a result of setting a goal, of set, having that goal. It's a result of, of living that goal out, living out that resolution successfully. Not only do we want to be like him, but we also get to live with him when we're faithful. The third thing is set small goals. When I set a long-term goal I think often what happens is when I stop there, about a week or two into trying to reach that goal, it suddenly looks like, you know what, I just can't reach it. It's impossible. And so it's important to set a long-term goal, but then to immediately set up steps and short goals that help me get to that long-term goal. So start with simple things saying, this week, I'm going to do this. By the end of the month, I'm going to, be doing to this, going to be doing this. And they all are leading towards that end goal, but I'm, I'm taking small steps to get there. It's much more manageable, and it also, it, it's also rewarding as humans when we do things and we accomplish them. And I feel fulfilled. Okay, I accomplished that. Now what am I going to do? What's the next step? And set another small goal and continue with the end goal still in mind, the long-term goal still in mind. So setting small goals, consistently setting them, with the long-term goal in mind. Colossians 3 verse 5 says, and this is our short-term goal that leads to that long-term goal of being focused on Christ, being focused on Him and having having affections towards Him. It says, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. These are the things we can live out, the the short steps that we can take to get us to that end goal. It is day-to-day things that we can do that leads us to our end goal. It's the hands-on. Verse 6 says, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. This is a result of falling back into the place that we were before we made that commitment. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. When we fall back and we don't follow through on verse 5, We experience the wrath of God. We've made a commitment. We've made a resolution to follow. We've committed to it. Are we being faithful in living out the small steps? Verse 7. In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. This is what I used to do. This is who I was before I made that commitment. Am I reverting back to that? Or am I faithfully taking the small steps? Am I living out, verse 5, mortifying my members which are on the earth? Am I taking steps 
in these areas to be faithful. Number four, self-discipline. First one is reason. The second one is set a long-term goal, set small goals, and then self-discipline. You know, self-discipline is probably one of the toughest ones of this whole list. What is self-discipline? Self-discipline is telling myself no, and it's telling myself yes to different things. And I challenge you to practice telling yourself no. Tell yourself no to things that actually aren't wrong, but could be a yes. There are times when I, when we practice self-control and telling myself no, it's, it's just good discipline. For instance, when we're on a diet, we decide we're not going to eat dessert, right? But sometimes it's okay not to be on a, on a diet and just decide, you know what, this week I'm not going to eat sweets. In the same way, in our spiritual life, there are times that it is good and well for us to say no to things that aren't necessarily sin and aren't necessarily wrong, but we're just practicing discipline, and we're teaching ourselves to say no. And a lot of our, a lot of our beings, a lot of our, our, our as humans, we, we push back from that because we don't like to tell ourselves no. In fact, we think it's it's gonna it's it's so hard, and it and it's and it's it's causing us to not enjoy things. But there is a part of saying no that is very rewarding. There is a part of saying no to things that I maybe wouldn't even have to say no to, that helps bring a discipline to my life, my physical life, and also my spiritual life. There is a reward in saying, you know what, I have the self-discipline that if I decide I'm not going to do this, that I can do that. And it's good practice for us to say no. On the other side, there is a part of discipline that should say yes to good things. Discipline is not just saying no, but it's also saying yes. It's making a choice to say no so that I have time and energy to say yes to the good things. Because when I'm busy saying no, no, no to everything, I get so distracted and so caught up with that and so sometimes bogged down that I, I forget that I need to be saying yes to good things. I need to be filling my life with good things and, and focusing on those also along with the no's. There should be plenty of yeses because there are plenty of things to focus on. There are plenty of things that, to commit to, to say yes to, that help us get to that end goal, that help us follow each daily step, the small steps, each monthly step, each maybe yearly step as I'm focused on a 10-year goal. Say yes to the small goals, to the small things. Verse 8 says, But now ye also put all put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. These are the no's that he's telling us to do. We should say no to anger. We should say no to wrath, to malice, to blasphemy, to filthy communication, and to lying. These are the no's. Discipline yourself to say no to these things. On the other hand, he has a list in the next several verses. Beginning in verse 10, it says, and have put on, and so these are the yeses. These are the yeses that we're supposed to do. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Remember, we raised up in that image. We committed to that. And so this is who we are. We've committed to this image. We've made a resolution. After the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. 
So it's, it's open to everyone. It's open to all of us. There are not specific people or classes or cultures that can't fulfill this. It's, it's open to all of us. And what are those things? Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, those who have committed to following God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. These are the things we're supposed to focus on, brothers and sisters. These are the things we should be pursuing. These are the things we should be saying yes to. These should be those daily goals, those monthly goals that we're setting. Yes, I'm going to express meekness. I'm going to be long-suffering with those around us, around me. I'm going to put on charity. These are the things that we say yes to. The fifth one is accountability. I believe it's important to have accountability to help us reach the resolutions and the commitments that we've made. Whether it's physical goals, it's, it's goals that we have made for our own personal lives, or whether it's a spiritual goal, a spiritual goal we need accountability. And I think that accountability in our spiritual life is clear in Scripture that it should be with like-minded believers, people that we associate with, that we have, we have the same goals in mind, and we are committed to the same thing. It should be the local brotherhood who we find to help us be accountable and who we should be connected to. Not only that, but our tendency is sometimes when we're looking for accountability partner is to find somebody who is interested in, in um, fulfilling the same goals that we are. So probably a, a good example is if, if, if we're interested in losing weight, we hear that our, our friend is, is also interested in that. And now we, we say, well, let's be accountable to one another. And so now we're, we're both trying to reach a certain goal. But my challenge to you is find somebody who has already reached the goal you're trying to reach. Find somebody who, who you see has been successful in that, whatever that is. Be accountable to them instead of somebody who is on the journey with you. It's good to sometimes have people on the journey with you, but you need somebody who, is, who has already accomplished it to be accountable to. Because that person is going to be able to look at where you're at and say, well, you're doing the wrong thing. That's not how you're going to get here. What you need to do is, is this and this and this because they've already experienced it. So be accountable to somebody who has already reached the goal that you're shooting for. Those people are in the church when we're looking at our spiritual goals. Those are people who have some years of experience on us. Those are people who we see being faithful in serving. Faithful in serving the brotherhood. Faithful in, in caring for those around them. Be accountable to them and say, how did you do that? I see something in your life that seems to come so natural for you. And that's what I want for my life. I see you being so consistent in your personal worship. In your, in your own personal time with the Lord. And you share how you have a connection with the Lord. How do you do that? What are the daily disciplines? What how do you go about that? Connect with those people. Pick their brain. Ask them to hold you accountable. Will you check in with me every couple weeks? Can I be accountable to you? Can I check in with you and tell you how it's going? Will you give me feedback and tell me what I should do? Be accountable. Accountability is so important. And he talks about that in Colossians chapter 3. Going to verse 15, it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body. And be ye thankful. This is talking about brotherhood. This is talking about the church, I believe. This is talking about Sandy Ridge. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. One of the things for accountability in the brotherhood is peace. There needs to be a peace. It is impossible. It is, it is very hard, if not impossible, to be accountable to one another when there's friction in relationships. And so there must be peace in the brotherhood in order for me to be accountable to someone, in order for them to come to me and want to be accountable to me. There needs to be peace. Because we don't enjoy accountability with someone who are, that we're experiencing friction with in our life. There needs to be a peace. And that should be a goal. The second verse, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know, church should be a fertile soil for the word of God to work in. As believers, our hearts and lives should be fertile, that when we hear God's word, that it has an effect on us. And I think sometimes we want the effect and the change of the word of God without the fellowship of the believers, without the accountability of the believers. We become disillusioned in our relationships and there's, there's things that we don't agree with one another and there are relationship issues. And so suddenly I think, well, the relationships are the issue. I'm just going to focus on Christ. I'm just going to focus on Scripture. And I'm, going to, and I'm going to receive from Scripture. And I'm going to grow in that area instead of taking care of relationships, instead of taking care of attitudes. And brothers and sisters, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. But sometimes... I really choose not to allow it to divide my heart and to open up my heart and to take a clean look at myself and say, you know what, I have some relationship issues with my brothers and sisters. And I don't think it's right and I don't think Scripture is effective in my personal walk when there are things in my life that I'm being affected by in the brotherhood. I don't think Scripture can have its effect on me when I have, when there's not peace with my brothers and sisters around me. I don't think it's right for me to look at the brothers and sisters around me and say, well, they are the ones who are at fault. It's, if they would get their act together, then I could, I could read Scripture and, and we could all read Scripture and we could be filled. But we need to take care of the relationships. We need to take care of the peace that we're called to have in relationships. And then I think the soil becomes fertile. And as we read the Word of God, as we hear teaching, we begin to soak it up. We begin to apply it. It begins to have an effect on us. Verse 17 says, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. The resolution of following Christ affects every area of our life. Everything we do, whether we're at work, whether we're at church, whether we're in town, whether we're on vacation, everything is affected by the resolution, by the, by the commitment that we've made, the business decisions that I make, the way I raise my family, the places we go, the things we do, the things we watch, the things we read are affected. They should be. They should be affected because we have an end goal in mind. We have made a commitment, and we're pursuing that end goal. But I repeat, there are things that need to be in order. The first one is the peace of God. The peace of God needs to rule in our hearts 
Going back to verse 14, put on charity. There needs to be a love towards those around me. Verse 13, forgiving and forbearing needs to happen. Are you identifying as a believer of Christ? Have you made that resolution? And I think many of us have. Probably most all of us have made that commitment. We've made a resolution. We've said, yes, I want to follow Christ. Are you committed to change your affections to heavenly things? Have you committed to that ever? Have you said no to the old man? Have you told that person who you used to be before you made the commitment that no, you're not in charge of me anymore? I have a new goal. Somebody else is in charge. I've made a new commitment. You're not the one who makes the decisions. There's a new man. Christ is, is in me. There's, there's something new. There's a new passion, a new commitment. Everything has changed. I'm not going to follow you anymore. And when he peeks up his head, we say, no, I've committed to here. I, I'm going this direction. I have this end goal in mind. Is there a new man living in you that cares and loves the brotherhood and also the lost? And we like to drop that first one pretty quickly and say, well, that one's not working out, so I'm going to focus on the lost. But brothers and sisters, if we're not successful in caring and serving the brotherhood, we will not be successful in caring and serving the lost. We will not be successful. Is God's word convicting and challenging and changing you today? You know, Arthur Stace made a choice to affect those around him for eternity by doing a simple thing repeatedly. He made a resolution and he kept it. And it was an eternal resolution and people around him were affected because of that. And I believe that when we make eternal resolutions, when there's a focus, when there's a commitment to an eternal resolution, it affects the people around us. People are drawn in when they see us pursuing an eternal resolution. People not only believers, not only those people that we go to church with, but non-Christians. It's the people that I, I mow for who see that that man has something different in mind. He's mowing my lawn, but he has a larger goal in mind. He cares about more about me and who I am than that my yard is cut right. It's the person who, when he builds a house, at the end of the construction project, the new owner says, not only is he a good contractor, but that, mind, that man is going somewhere else. He's not just building houses. He has a goal in mind. There's something different about him. He's going somewhere. What is he, where is he going? What's he doing? It's the mothers that go through the checkout lanes at Walmart and start to develop relationships with the people checking out where the checkout lady says, there's something different about her. She's not always in a hurry. She has time to ask me how Christmas was. There's something different. Where's she going? Why is she doing what she's doing? Brothers and sisters, our end goals, our resolutions affect the people around us. And it's important that we follow through on our resolution to serve Christ. It's important that we take those steps, that we live them out day to day, that people have no question we're going somewhere. They have no question the way we run our businesses, that not only is the business successful, but the people working in those businesses and the people who are being served by those businesses are being affected. They're being challenged to go somewhere. They're being challenged to make commitments like that person made. We need to be effective. We need to make resolutions that have lasting changes. Not that just serve me and my desires and my thrills that I enjoy. Are you making eternal resolutions? And if you have, are you following through on them? Let's kneel for prayer.
Father in heaven, we come before